Hey Shepard, how are you? I'm good. Welcome to Entrepreneurship Couch. Thank you very much. Thanks for the good program. Keep it up. Mr. Brains, uh, we are grappling with the coronavirus uh, issue. And we have thought maybe we need to invite uh, economists like you to give us uh, a comment. So my first question is going to be, what is your general comment in terms of the impact of coronavirus on the general economy? <laughs> Thank you, Shepard. I hope you are keeping safe as well. You are staying at home and uh, protecting uh, others around you. Sure, definitely. Uh, thank you very much. Um, um, look, um, the coronavirus um, has created um, an unprecedented uh, 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 situation around the world. And um, the effect is on, not only on Zimbabwe, as you can see. Uh, in fact, around the world, all the economies are grappling uh, with the impact of um, the coronavirus. Quite a number of countries have come up with some rescue packages, you know, all the way from the US uh, to as local as South Africa, uh, where um, policymakers are, are worried about the impact of this virus on the economy, in particular on jobs, on domestic spending, and of course on their currencies. Um, locally, I think we have not been uh, spared as a country. Um, the lockdown that we have um, gotten into is definitely going to create a lot of challenges uh, in terms of um, the broader macroeconomic stability. You are looking at the, the impact of lockdown on jobs. You are looking at the impact of the uh, lockdown on the output um, GDP for this year. You are looking at the impact of um, this on consumer the demand and spending, which have all been affected significantly uh, by the lockdown. So the impact is definitely huge. Uh, it's unprecedented. We've never seen this before. In fact, there is no one around the world who can uh, today authoritatively um, talk about how this is going to end and how this is going to impact uh, on economies because we don't know when this thing is going to end. Uh, Mr. Brains, uh, from your own uh, um, uh experience or from an expert uh, advice as an economist which sectors are likely to be affected most when you look at our domestic economy in particular which uh, is more relevant to this discussion um, if you look at the tourism industry for example is an industry that is going to be the hardest hit uh, and of course all the other industries um, in the in the downstream um, that provide uh, goods and services to the tourism industry and other industries of course that um, survive off the, the tourism industry so you look at what has happened already on hotels around the country, they've all been shut. You look at all the major tourist uh, resorts in this country, they are shut. And we don't know uh, the extent to which uh, this is going to, uh, to, to, to impact on them. They might actually be shut for the whole year, you never know. Because when you look at the global sentiment right now, I think the last thing that a person wants to do is to go on tourism. Uh, either you contract the virus or you will be, you, 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 you will be locked down uh, in, a, in a country so far away from home. So so even if these restrictions are lifted around the world, I think the general thinking around the around tourists right now is that you would rather be safe in your country, you'd rather be safe at home, uh, because you don't know really uh, when the next, um, uh, you know, because we're just coming out of this, something that has never happened before. So the tourism industry is definitely going to be the hardest hit. But as well, you're not looking at tourism alone in this country. You're looking at the structure of the Zimbabwean economy, uh, which is largely informal. Uh, the informal sector in this country plays a significant role uh, and it sustains a lot of livelihoods in this country. And when you look at what this has done to the informal sector. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite sad, it's, it's unprecedented. You're looking at the disruption of uh, incomes for many people that live from hand to mouth. You're looking as well at the closure of the borders. Most of our informal sector, if you're going to be much practical, they rely on, you know, hustling, buying goods and, and selling, you know, uh, competing, of course, with the few established businesses. But when the borders are closed, the South African border is closed right now, you can't fly into China. So the disruption that has happened to the business 
uh, 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 models of the informal sector in this economy uh, is amazing uh, and it's definitely going to affect a lot of people and it's going to affect as well not just those people but it's going to affect, to have repercussions on the wider economy because these are people that who spending power uh, is important in in bolstering uh, domestic demand but when all that is cut off definitely we are in a huge uh, crisis uh, at the moment Mr. Brains, uh, a lot of people uh, during crisis would then look up to their governments. And uh, 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 in the very same context, we have heard of uh, the USA announcing a disaster fund of about 2.2 trillion, Japan coming up with about 2 billion. Closer home, South Africa has talked about a solidarity fund. And uh, just yesterday, the Minister of Finance from South Africa was talking about. Uh, trying to approach the IMF for, for about six million uh, uh, funding towards the pandemic. Do you think our own government is done enough to try and uh, help people in this crisis? That's a very difficult um, aspect to look at, in particular when you consider the state of our economy. Definitely, I think our government has, 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 has an interest and um, has a desire uh, to try and assist the vulnerable and to assist the cushion the economy uh, from the aftermath of uh, the uh, lockdown and all the other issues associated with the coronavirus. But I think what is important is to look at the practicality of the interventionist measures that our government can um, can come up with. When you look at the state of our domestic finances, they are very fragile at the moment. Uh, more so, uh, considering the fact that our inflation is very high, just almost above 600%, you're looking at an exchange rate that is depreciating on a weekly basis. You're looking at a, a country that has no international reserves at all. So, in, and we have been running a budget deficit. Last year, we ran a huge budget deficit that created a lot of challenges uh, on inflation and of course the inflation that we're seeing today is 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 is, is, is coming from the huge uh, ex or the excessive money supply that came through in financing uh, the de budget deficits from last year so when you look at all that and you put all that into context you will then understand that in as much as our government might have the interest to intervene in the market from a fiscal perspective to bring to come up with the fiscal stimulus it has no capacity. I think that is one thing that has to be very clear. Our government has no capacity whatsoever to come up with a, stim a fiscal stimulus that will be able to cushion businesses and individuals from the effects of the coronavirus. If at all it so decides to do that, which is quite possible, the government can so decide to just wake up in the morning and print a lot of money uh, to try and uh, put money in the pockets of uh, individuals and corporates. But what that does, it creates a significant or an unprecedented uh, inflationary spiral that will even hit this economy much more than what uh, the coronavirus is going to do. So from a prudence perspective, I think that it is our government would rather not print money at the moment because that is the only option that is available uh, to try and uh, ameliorate the, the situation because by doing so, there will be... Um, decimating balances of corporates that are still standing in the market because the, infl the associated inflation that is going to come with that uh, will definitely erode balances. It is going to erode uh, savings for people. It's going to destroy the purchasing power and it's going to destroy business confidence. It's going to disrupt a lot many other things much worse than what the coronavirus would do. Look at the economy in 2008, for example. I think this economy was in worse shape than what it is today with the coronavirus. Even if we're going to go for two months in a lockdown, I think this economy will still be in a better shape than what it was in 2008 when without coronavirus, we printed a lot of money and disrupted the economy. So from that perspective, um, I think I've made it clear, Shepard, we, we, our government has no capacity. And any unconventional means to come up with a stimulus, a fiscal stimulus, we will have more repercussions, uh, adverse repercussions than just you know managing and absorbing uh, the shocks as they come uh, with the little that we have. Uh, the economy has generally been resilient. You see what has happened in this economy before, and I think at the best moment, any uh, rational thinking Zimbabwean uh, who understands the impact of um, money supply on the economy would rather uh, put that aside and say, look, 
as an economy, we're never prepared for this. Our economy is in bad shape already. Let's just stay put and see uh, the best that uh, we can do with the little that we have without trying to intervene in the market. Uh, the following question, Mr. Brains, I don't know if uh, it's going to be a fair question, but others have suggested that our government could come up with tax holidays, but not only that, they could maybe interfere and announce uh, 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 somewhere where they could say people maybe can stop paying rentals, uh, interfering with private business. What's your opinion on that? Yeah, that's, look, uh, these are trying times, Shepard. People will come up with a lot of things because these are people that are hard-pressed. You see, the background is that there are a lot of very few companies in this country and few individuals that have savings. Uh, when inflation is this high, the last thing that you have is to, um, <laughs> is to, the last thing that a person would have are savings in the bank, you see. So the environment is hard-pressed at the moment. Um, Tax holidays, yes, but I, I think we need to look at it from uh, from uh, from 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 the two perspectives. Because we are already running a budget deficit, and because the coronavirus is going to hit us much worse than most of these other economies that are more stable, the last thing that you want to do is to disrupt the tax, the government revenue, uh, which would be coming from the legitimate uh, productive sources of the economy. So, yes. Tax holidays are very good. I would look at the situation where there can be some, 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 not necessarily some holiday of some sort, but I don't know how to say it, but I would look at a situation where it's the, the, the government can actually um, get into uh, some understanding with the revenue authority. Of course, the revenue authority is the government itself anyway, and allow people to defer some tax heads so that at least the corporates are able to conserve working capital. I think the most important thing right now, Shepard, is that because of the lockdown, there are very few companies that have the capacity to protect or to uh, galvanize working capital at a time uh, that inflation has been ravaging. And um, if you look at the fact that we've gone now for 20, or we're going to go for 21 days, if that is not going to be extended, uh, without uh, trade, um, that is going to affect the working capital cycles of business significantly. And there are very few companies in this country that have capacity to run a payroll, pay rentals, and meet other tax obligations on zero revenue. I think that is very clear. So what the government can actually do is to come and and post and, and, and make some arrangement where they can defer the payment of some taxes that are due so that at least companies are able to conserve working capital, get back into business and with time then pay off uh, those uh, tax obligations. So definitely that's a good idea and I would support that. And of course I'm looking as well at the uh, interest obligations for, for the banking sector in this country. I think when you look at the state of the banking sector in this country, Shepard, the banking sector is not in distress at all. Uh, because of inflation, the non-performing loans, have, uh, the percentage of non-performing loans, you know, has really been coming off significantly. And when you look at the structure of bank balances, they are very liquid right now, about 70% liquidity ratio for the banking sector, which is quite amazing. And um, uh, it, from a from a from, when you look at at, at this, the health of all the the, the 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 health status of the financial institution and the loan to deposit ratios because the liquidity ratios are high the loan to deposit ratios as well are quite low for the banking sector uh, around 34 35 percent there about so what it means is that the banking sector has capacity at the moment this capacity which does not impact on its solvency to suspend interest uh, on borrowers uh, and then come up with arrangements where interest that was due this month can be paid over the next three months or so. Uh, this is interest that is not going to be forfeited, but it's interest that has been, it's interest uh, uh, income that has just been deferred, you see. What it does, it protects the economy, it protects the bank clients, and in the end, it protects the banks themselves. So I think this is another issue that can be looked at um, uh, by the government and try and intervene uh, to ensure that at least we don't disrupt the working capital cycles of companies. I think what the most important thing right now is to save jobs. But you don't save jobs by telling companies to stop the uh, retrenchment. You, you save jobs by looking at how you can intervene 
on the most important aspects that can then disrupt the jobs. And to me, work, managing working capital for the corporates is one issue right now. And managing their obligations, their creditors as well, is another issue. And the creditors that we can talk of at the moment that can come in handy is the, uh, the, the, the banks and, of course, um, the tax authorities. So if we can come up with something around that, uh, definitely we'll be able um, to salvage uh, something for this economy. It's not a good decision uh, in the eyes of the bankers because they want to capitalize on their earnings today. But look, at the end of the day, there's a point where in life you say, this has to be done for the greater good of the economy. But the good thing, like I said, is that at least the good thing is that households in Zimbabwe, household indebtedness is very low. When you look at household income as a percentage of um, uh, household debt as a percentage of disposable income in Zimbabwe, it's quite, it's quite low, it's less than 40%. Uh, when you look at um, uh, the loan to deposit ratio, like I said, it's around 35-40%. So it means generally uh, that uh, a lot, many companies are not indebted, uh, they are self-sufficient. Uh, but for those that are indebted, I think uh, it would not be a bad idea to uh, create some soft lending for them so that we protect their working capital in the meanwhile, uh, but uh, in the same time, allowing them to meet their obligations uh, uh, as time goes, as the economy corrects itself. Uh, brains, uh, whilst we may not pick on any particular uh, corporates and uh, individual entrepreneurs, we have seen um, uh, well-known business people around the world, people like uh, Jack Ma and in South Africa, the Rupert uh, Motsepe, making a contribution towards um, COVID-19. Do you think our corporates and entrepreneurs can do something or have they done enough to... Uh, help in this crisis? When I look at what has been happening around uh, Shepard, I think, uh, to be honest with you, um, this has to be looked within the context of the economy and the context of the environment. Um, this is an economy that has not created many billionaires uh, as, as other economies around the world because the economy has never been stable in the past 20 years or 30 years or so. So what that has done, it has, it has really weakened the, the corporate balances in this economy. All balances that derive their livelihoods on Zimbabwe have been weakened significantly. And so what it does, it then, it then limits uh, the, the ability of, or the, even if the corporates were interested or had keen interest in, in intervening significantly, they have been unfortunately uh, limited by the weak uh, balances uh, which have uh, survived the last, which have been battling to survive for the last um, uh, 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 30 years or so. But that said, I think there has been a lot that has been coming from the corporate world in terms of assistance, uh, in, in equipping hospitals, drilling boreholes, uh, in buying ventilators, uh, etc. So, look, we have seen Strive Masiwa coming on board. Uh, look, Econet is a big company in this country. Not that they have a lot of money, but I think it's a gesture of goodwill. And uh, we've seen as well Delta coming on board. These are the big corporates. And when you look at the figures, the names that we're talking about, these are the big um, household um, uh, corporates or the, the billionaires around the world that have been chipping in. And, but when you look at Zimbabwe, like I said, we don't have billionaires in this country. Uh, the environment has not been allowing that. Uh, maybe one day you'll be a billionaire, but definitely you'll be able to chip in. But uh, in short, I should say, look, we, we have seen a lot of goodwill coming out of the companies. There, there are a few funds that have been set up by private individuals and uh, so on to try and, uh, and help and ameliorate the situation. And I think that is quite commendable, considering the very weak state of corporate balance in this country. Uh, and remember, uh, the recent statistics from the Reserve Bank, when they came out saying that when, I think 90%, 99% of the money in this economy is just held uh, or in the accounts of just less than 200 companies. So I think those are the 200 companies that uh, should be coming on board and assisting. But I should say we have definitely been seeing uh, a lot of goodwill coming from the corporates. And I think if... Zimbabweans had much more, they would be chipping in. The other good thing as well is that the figures that are being said uh, or that are being reported, uh, whether they reflect the exact numbers of people that have coronavirus or not is another thing. If you have 25 uh, uh, people that are infected or 20 thereabout, 
look, it's not been really sounding the alarm. So, so look, I think it's manageable. We, whatever it is, the corporates, I think they've done enough, and um, I commend them. And I think should the numbers continue to increase and the distress calls continue to come to, to get louder, I think Zimbabweans will always be chipping in. Look at what happened at Cyclone Ida. It's amazing. Uh, people came together. They put their resources, including individuals, uh, because the cause was there. It was real. People could see it. And with the coronavirus at the moment, uh, I think in as much as it's creating a lot of, you know, waves around the globe locally, I think uh, to be all fair, we've really not been seeing a lot uh, in terms of the misery, etc. Of course, it's there, but it's not as amplified uh, or as, as, as what is happening around the world. So, don't worry. I think once once the need comes, we'll definitely chip, yeah, companies will chip in. Okay. Uh, Brains, we have focused on the general economy. Uh, now, uh, would you maybe focus on the uh, informal sector? Uh, a lot that I've spoken to, they've said the, they are grappling in between a hard place and a rock. They are saying either they are running away from the lockdown that has been caused by COVID-19 or they would rather be uh, running away from hunger. What's your comment in terms of the informal sector impact? You see, the informal sector is the bedrock of this economy, whether we like it or not. Some studies uh, even talk to talk about the informal sector contributing to as much as uh, uh, 60 to 70 percent uh, of uh, the, the the output in this country, uh, which is unfortunately some of it is unrecorded, etc. So that sector is is very important but unfortunately like we've said they are now in between a hard rock and a hard place uh there is corona on the other side which unfortunately which unfortunately is creating a lot of havoc around the world at least for at the moment not yet in zimbabwe and uh the informal sector is now having to contend with staying at home and losing business and starving or uh trying to get out there and still go catch the virus and, uh, and, 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 and find, find themselves uh, dead. So it's not an easy time, Shepard, to be in for the informal sector in this country. And I think what is needed uh, from a policy perspective is to then look at how the government can intervene, save lives, and of course save the economy. We need to save the economy. Uh, there's life after coronavirus, uh, definitely. And of course, life will change significantly after this uh, lockdown and the many other lockdowns that might come. Uh, but life has to go on. Uh, my thinking is that the government can, because of the numbers that we have, Shepard, we are around 25, I think, 25 or thereabout. Our numbers are still modest. Uh, look, even if they are 100, they are still modest. They are still uh, manageable. Uh, at the moment, uh, and I'm looking at a situation where, in line with the World Health Organization social distancing and other guidelines that are coming from the health aspect, the government can actually come up with a win-win situation where they start opening up some some areas and companies, you know, uh, and and closing off some, and 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 they're having a phased approach or a gradual approach. The only problem that that has is that it hits the informal sector hard because. It's most likely is the informal sector that will be opened the last. Why? Because that is where you find a lot of concent human concentration, unfortunately. And that is the catch-22 situation that we have, Shepard. Uh, and my heart goes to the informal sector, the sector that has been at the center of sustaining this economy. But at this point in time, you might find that they will be the last to be, to be opened. And you are looking at this people that buy goods and services from South Africa, that import from China, the borders are closed on the other side. So life is not going to be easy. Uh, we need a new paradigm shift. And I think that's where it comes, where people then start talking about the need to, to refocus the economy and look at how we can uh, look at issues to do with import substitution, create new jobs, create a new economy, a new world. Because this world of uh, cross-border selling, for example, um, or buying and selling, uh, trading uh, can easily be disrupted, as you have seen, uh, with uh, global lockdowns. It's something that had never happened before, but definitely is affecting uh, the lives and livelihoods of the majority in this country. Mr. Brains, I don't want to put you on the spot. I'm going to be again asking a very unfair question. You are an employer yourself, you are a business person, but I want you to focus on all the employers and business people. They are faced with a situation where 
they've got to struggle with the uh, paying uh, employees and their revenues may not be allowing or permitting. What's your advice? What's the way forward? Difficult question, Shepard. Um, you can't generalize it in this, can this country in particular. Why? I think context is always important. I always want to start from context. So you're looking at a country that has had high inflation for the last, uh, even recently, for the last two years, mm -hmm. right? Inflation, the exchange rate has been depreciating sharply. So what that means is that it will be very rare to find corporates with savings uh, on their balance sheet, right? Because the environment is not permitting. And... Uh, uh, we are just looking as well at a situation where most NECs around um, uh, around most of these sectors have just increased salaries uh, significantly uh, in the last, uh, I think, two months or so. So the wage bills had already just started going up uh, unsustainably for most of these companies. And we're talking about the issue of the minimum wage uh, that has just been gazetted. So when now you look at take all that, and superimpose a lockdown for 21 days, zero revenue, it becomes very difficult to find employers that have zero revenue for a month that will be able to run payrolls and meet other obligations like rentals and, uh, and interest payment uh, for their loans. So it's going to be a very difficult time for employers. What is the ideal? The ideal is that salaries should be paid. Right, because these are obligations that have to be met. Our labor laws are not as flexible. Shepherd, you just don't wake up in the morning and say, Because I it closed it for what the woman then I'm not going to pay a salary. But I'm see I'm looking at a situation where I think salaries would need to be paid. But I think some arrangements would need to be made between employers and employees, those that they don't have capacity to meet all their full obligations at one time, at one go this month, to look at ways of staggering the payments so that at least you protect the working capital. Like I said earlier, the most important aspect right now for this economy and for policymakers is to ensure that corporates are able to protect their working capital, including even the informal sector, to protect their working capital so that they're able to get back into business. Because there has to be life after coronavirus. So anything that will allow the corporates to conserve a bit of working capital, because with zero revenue, Shepard is not easy to run a payroll. With zero revenue, it's not easy to meet um, uh, interest obligations for the banks. And remember, most of these companies as well, because we pay our taxes in Zimbabwe, you know, uh, in, in a deferred format, your VAT, your withholding tax, most of them, they actually rely on the revenues generated in that month to meet uh, tax payments for the previous month, you see because savings are not, virtually non-existent on balance sheet. So a lot many people are going to have to contend with having to pay Zimra this month, this coming month, for obligations for the last month. Uh, we yet they would not have generated anything, uh, you see. Um, so it's, it's not going to be an easy time, but I think that is where the government should come in. Uh, there are people that have to pay renters, shepherds, employees. Mm -hmm. it, it's... it's it's a fact of life. They have to pay rentals because the landlords, some of them, they had invested in, 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 in houses and that's all they have. They are elderly and that's what they survive on. And to then expect them not to demand rentals, for example. Look, in as much as it sounds right at the moment, but that is the source of their livelihood. Uh, so definitely, my thinking is that salaries would need to be paid, but... Uh, each individual company has each initial, uh, unique peculiarities and they will need to look at their uh, cash flows and see how best they can, uh, they, can, they can do that going forward. The last thing that we want Shepard at the moment is to lose jobs. Um, we have very few formal jobs in this economy and the last thing that we want to do is to lose them. Uh, for the informal sector, unfortunately, look, they've not been trading. Uh, uh, they don't have income and like I said earlier the most important thing now for the government is to look at how we can start opening up the economy sectorally so that at least we are able to protect uh, the people, to protect humanity I think humanity is what we need to protect and hunger in this country Shepard, is not something that is uh, far-fetched it's real because of the structure of the economy uh, Brains, maybe let's move on and focus on the manufacturing and productive uh, sector. Others have said uh, the coronavirus is going to give them an opportunity to uh, look at the uh, manufacturing and production. 
what's your comment in terms of the economic lockdown? Does it present opportunities uh, for the manufacturing sector and uh, uh, productive sector? When you look at what has happened around the world, uh, Shepard, definitely a lot many countries around the world have discovered that they need to be self-sufficient in many other aspects. Uh, you look at what is happening in the US, you look at what is happening in China, you look at what is happening in, in the UK. Uh, look, these developed countries uh, where it's, it's the coronavirus has hit the most. They are now looking at ways of even being self-sufficient because of the huge demands for issues, things like ventilators, PPE, for um, uh, the uh, health, health care, uh, workers, etc. For us, there is definitely an opportunity uh, to come up with um, um, uh, 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 with with import substitution policies. But Shepard, that doesn't happen overnight, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, it's easy to talk about companies waking up in the morning and substituting uh, imports and being self-sufficient as a country, but they are two issues that you need to look at. You need a stable in work in economic environment for you to do that. I think that's the most important thing. This, whatever new equipment, machinery, etc., it needs capital. And this is not the local capital that you have the bond notes, unfortunately. These are US dollars that you need to import to actually be able to start making these things. And because the borders are closed and um, uh, the, there is a disruption in the global supply value chain it's not going to be easy to just wake up in the morning and say i think i need that equipment from china yes it can come but it's not going to to, to come overnight number two because you are not using bond north mm -hmm. you need a stable environment so that you are able to re, uh, to to have a return on investment and be able to to to, to get meaning out of out of the investment that is not yet available so we need a commitment from the policymakers to ensure that we've got a stable environment. And the, stable, the stability in the environment is going to attract a lot many other players locally and internationally to maximize or to tap into the opportunities that are going to be availed, uh, especially as the, lockdown, as the lockdowns continue around the world. So yes, it's possible, but I think there are issues to do with the environment, like I said, that needs to be to be stabilized before we talk about import substitution you are as well going to look at the issues to do with um, the government support yes government now is removed duty on most of these medical products etc because we don't have capacity to produce them we've just been able to produce a few masks um and some sanitizer which is very commendable shepherd because remember just before this we used to import almost everything uh, most of these things were being imported and i commend the efforts by the Minister of uh, Higher and Tertiary Education, uh, Professor Murwira, you see, we've been seeing universities producing uh, most of these uh, things that we never thought could be produced, you know, within a week in Zimbabwe, you know. And it says a lot about the capacity and resilience of Zimbabweans, Shepard. So what we just need is the enabling environment. If the policy framework is right, if the environment is stable, I think the government can rally and and bank on that resilience, you know, and, you know, that drive within Zimbabweans. Unfortunately, at the moment, the environment uh, is the one that is putting us on the back foot. Inflation is very high, the exchange rate is not stable. So the last thing that you want to do is to experiment and put a lot of money or get into debt instruments that, in US dollars, that will uh, probably be uh, that which takes you to the grave as a corporate. But there are opportunities, and I, I commend every other company in this country that is taking this opportunity to look at how we can uh, be self-sufficient on many other things. The borders are not going to open uh, short uh, anytime soon, uh, Shepard, in my own view. Uh, and the global supply chains have been disrupted, and that disruption is going to have an impact for the whole year. And it is an opportunity. And this is a time where government, instead of looking at other things, should be coming up with a fund. Not a huge fund, but a fund to for startups and companies that are getting into um, uh, uh, import uh, substitution. This is the time for Mtuli uh, to stand up and say, look, uh, we are willing to help uh, those that want to put capital at risk. We are willing to put in our capital as a government so that at least we, we take the economy forward. Uh, uh, Brains, maybe before I, last, uh, I ask my last final question, there's been just a, a, a rumor 
uh, on social media, which is talking about uh, the five-year de-dollarization roadmap, whether it's true or not. But uh, from your own understanding as an economist, if this is true, what does it mean to the economy? Yeah, there are a lot of ambiguities. I've seen that document, Shepard, it's, it's, it's circulating on social media, uh, the de-dollarization plan. Uh, look, it, the, the assumption is that we are in a dollarized environment, of which we are not in, you see, as a, for starters, even if the policymakers were interested in coming up with that document, I think they need to put their wording correctly. We are not in a dollarized environment at the moment. We are in a multiple currency regime. But... That aside, Shepard, what it says is that we need to sit down as a country. Our policymakers need to sit down, sober up, and say to themselves, look, there have been too many experiments in this economy. Uh, in, 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 we've tried many things. We, we abandoned the one is to one. Uh, in fact, we came up with the one is to one and said the US dollar was equal to the bond note. And when everyone else didn't see it, you know, making sense to say that we did that. And then we kept with it. We started coming up with funny subsidies in the market. We disrupted the, uh, the this exchange rate uh, to a, an extent where it, it seems to make sense, but we insisted that it was one is to one. We then, then re removed the peg. We then got back into the multiple currency and then we then abandoned the multiple currency and said, look, it's not working. We are now getting into a mono currency and before you know it just last week before the lockdown began we then said ah now we can allow us dollars again back into the economy so when you look at what the main main policy changes that have happened in the last one year Shepard, they are just too many mm -hmm. they are just too many uh, an experiment for an economy i think there is a point where we need to sit and say to ourselves and reflect and say to ourselves how many more experiments do we need to come up with before we find the right formula? A, that de-dollarization plan which is circulating, uh, Shepard, look, to be honest with you, uh, you, can, you can look at it, believe it today, uh, I think that is going to be implemented, but because of our history of policy inconsistency, and our consistencies in policy inconsistency, Shepard, you can find that we can come up with that document today, say, believe that it's a good thing to do. And then uh, three months down the line, we disband it and we come up with another thing. So I think at the end of the day, my, my point, Shepard, is whatever we're going to come up with, I think there's a point where before we come up with anything in from a policy perspective. This is my message to uh, the Minister of Finance, uh, his permanent secretary, George, um, these are the people that we look up to. And my, my, my message to them is, I think we have had enough in terms of the many experiments. What we now need is to sit down and say to ourselves, what is the best foot forward for this country? There are a lot of other policies that are not speaking to each other, Shepard, at the moment. For example, we've got the subsidy policy that we all know is not sustainable. The fuel subsidy policy, the maize meal subsidy policy, we all know those subsidy policies are not sustainable. They create a lot of money supply growth. They create an incentive for the government to fix the exchange rate, which disincentivizes exporters to export. And all those things which we know for sure they are not sustainable. Uh, even the monocurrency at the time that they introduced the monocurrency, I think it was clear to everyone that it was not going, it was not going to stand because the environment was bad at the moment. Uh, it was not very stable. But still, we persisted. We went with it. And then just last week, we said, OK, we can bring back this. this year. So, Shepard, look, uh, as economists, I think I'm equally surprised by the many policy changes. We have become a country that is so consistent with policy inconsistencies right to the extent that it is now very predictable in zimbabwe the most predictable thing in zimbabwe right now is, is the policy change that's the most predictable thing in fact there are some people that say ah, the environment in zimbabwe is not predictable it's very predictable because you can predict with certainty that policies are going to change and that's look no one can dispute that so shepard it's a document that is circulating to be honest with you look until we have a DNA of policy consistency, 
anything good, anything bad can come up today in Zimbabwe. Tomorrow it will be overturned, etc. So I think there's a point where Mutuli, uh, Professor Mutuli Ngobe, and George Guamatanga, uh, why do I uh, single those two out, uh, Shepard? It's because they are at the core of the economic ministries in this country. And they are good people. I've interacted with them many times. And when I talk to, when the few times that I've spoken to them, um, Shepard, they are people that I, I, I don't come to, that, that when I look at them, they don't, um, they don't put it across that they've uh, this uh, challenge in policy consistency. But where the wheels come off, I have no idea. Uh, and sometimes even when they are announcing policies, you can see from the facial expressions and the body expressions that they don't believe in what they'll be saying. And I think this is the moment to reflect. The coronavirus has given us time to sit at home, reflect. And I think the same is happening in the from a policy. Uh, perspective. Everything is quiet, it's closed down. I think this is the right time to say, have we been doing enough as a country? I think the answer is no, we've not been doing enough. What can we do? I think there are a lot that we can do. And I hope uh, these two gentlemen um, will be able to to assist us. We just need about five years of stability, Shepard. Uh, at least, you know, just to be stable for a while before, without worrying about what the government is doing. Because at the moment, I think the major challenge that we have is that instead of businesses worrying about their competitors, what their competition is doing and how they should twitch their plans to suit and outdo their competition, they are worrying about government. What is the government likely to do next on this policy? What is government going to do next on this issue? What is so I think at the end of the day, because we are Zimbabweans and we are resilient, uh, we should be able to say, look, we have had enough in terms of these experiments. Uh, the Reserve Bank, the Minister of Finance, I think they are key uh, in coming up uh, with something that will uh, be uh, a win-win uh, for this economy. And I hope uh, Shepard, that because I'm in business, I hope that uh, look, uh, we are going to get that. Brains, uh, I'm very grateful for uh, the uh, uh, program that we have had, but we can't let you go. We want to call out on the business person that is in you. We know you are an entrepreneur. A lot of business people are stressed at the moment. They are faced with a lot of challenges. They don't know whether we are going to survive out of this. What's your uh, uh, advice? What's your recommendation? What can you say to another business person who is faced with the situation we are in at the moment? Shepard, this is not the right time to be in business, believe me, or to be an entrepreneur. Uh, these are times that you would prefer to read in history. Uh, <laughs> that look, there was a coronavirus, there was a lockdown, and this is what happened. Like what happened in the Great Depression? What do we just read about the Great Depression, etc.? And I think that is what under normal circumstances, every other entrepreneur would be preferring not to be in. But look, it's not the end of the world. And the good thing is that it's not affecting Zimbabweans alone. It's affecting everyone across the world. And I think the most important thing then to say is, the most important uh, uh, attribute is to say, is to look at resilience. How do you become resilient? And how do you change your business models? under the current circumstances to be able to suit the changing world. There are some industries, Shepard, that are not going to come back <laughs> after this coronavirus. And there are some business models that have been changed completely uh, with the coronavirus. Even when you look at the attitude of people after the coronavirus in terms of uh, uh, meetings, uh, you know, the, the social interactions, there are some businesses, Shepard, that definitely are not going to see the light of day anymore or who are, whose fortunes are going to be diminished significantly by the impact of the coronavirus. My message, Shepard, is that we just have to hang in there uh, we have no choice. We have to hang in there. We have to protect jobs. And um, look, uh, there are others that are going to close. Uh, that is not in doubt there. And if you find that the fortunes are not in your favor and you're running a business and your cash flows are not going to be able to sustain you for the next three months, uh, because there are some companies that are going to remain on lockdown for the next five eight months, six months, even if we open up the economy, for example, in the tourism industry. Uh, uh, I happen to be in the tourism industry, so some sort. Life is not going to be easy. Life is not going to be difficult. And there are hard decisions that would have to be made by companies to protect their balances. Uh, 
Uh, and those that need to make decisions, yeah, but my, my, my advice is that if you need to make a decision to protect your balance sheet, you have to do it now. Uh, if you have to close the business because you can see that in the next six months you're not going to be in business and you're going to lose money, I would rather you close the business now. If you believe you can streamline operations and remain with that which you can be able to nest until the economy turns, we'd rather implement it now. It's important uh, to lose part of the business now and then be able to, you know, to, to, to recover later than to try and hang on to a business today for the next three, four months, and then eventually you lose everything. You lose your balance, you lose your working capital, and you know you are out of business. So it's not an easy time, Shepard. Uh, this is a time that I wish I was uh, just starting business, for example, a time that I wish uh, I was reading this uh, is something that happened some, some many years ago. Uh, when uh, so that at least you'll be trying to just draw lessons. But look, the Zimbabweans are Zimbabweans. We have been resilient before. Uh, uh, the good thing is that very few businesses have huge uh, uh, balance. Uh, so we look at our businesses because of the state of the economy. We, we are work, working on very thin working capital. So it will not be too difficult to replace that because we have very thin balances already. You know, we have been living from hand to mouth as a, as a business, as businesses in, in Zimbabwe for quite, for quite a long time. So it, it, the impact will not be as disastrous as those that have, are not used to uh, hit these cycles. We have been in many of these cycles in 2010, 2009, that about. Uh, even now, Shepard, when we, we, we converted balances, there are some balances that uh, had been living under the pretext that it was one is to one for some time, and all of a sudden they found themselves exposed when we abandoned the one is to one, but they are still surviving. So, look, we have to survive, unfortunately. Uh, we might change business models, but that's the fact of life. And we have people like you, Shepard, the, uh, the entrepreneurial coaches that are going to be there. I hopefully, you are going to you know, help a few other businesses survive, yeah? uh, give them tips on how to survive in this uh, difficult time. Mm. Brains, uh, thanks very much. I must reiterate that this platform has benefited immensely from your contribution. Uh, I cannot continue talking about it, but uh, you have helped us as entrepreneurs to negotiate the landscape because of your economic expertise. Once again, thanks very much for your time. Hope to talk to you again soon. Thank you, Shepard.